So a little introduction. My name is Patrick Camacho. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Twitter. I work on the Crashlytics product. Um, and you know, my main focus is on the front end, building uh, thick client applications. So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is some of the patterns that we've learned and we use uh, building the Crashlytics web application and how those patterns can be applied to anything that you're building. So first, a quick uh, introduction to Crashlytics. Uh, Crashlytics provides software and SDK for Android and iOS to help mobile developers detect crashes that occur in their applications out in the wild. And so there are over a billion crashes that happen every single day. Uh, it's a lot of data to manage. Oh, sorry about that. So we work with all these, uh, you know, these big applications, uh, and we kind of uh, help them basically make better software. So we track all the crashes that come in, we aggregate them together into issues, and then we provide insight into what's going on uh, through this web dashboard. And so our web dashboard really consists of three primary components. Uh, we allow users to, or developers, to look at their issues grouped by uh, impact level and see overall health of their application. Uh, they can dive into a specific issue and view all sorts of information regarding uh, you know, how many times it's happened, the operating systems it's occurring on, any relevant information that might give insight into why their application is crashing. And then we show them the session view that allows them to actually look at an individual instance of a crash and see all the threads and all the details that may be relevant to them as a developer. And so my job at, uh, at Twitter is to work on building this web application and to build this great user experience to make it easy for developers to figure out what's wrong with their application and improve it. And so in September of last year, we decided that we wanted to go away from a heavy uh, Rails website and move over to Backbone. We wanted a thick client. And the reason why was, well, anyone who's heard talks about thick clients could probably tell you user experience, being able to keep the code, native-like functionality. And for us, a big part was actually being able to separate out the concerns. So we wanted our server to be responsible for data and for our web client to be responsible for the rendering and the manipulation and the visualization of that data. And so we chose Backbone to do this. <clears throat> and Backbone gave us a few uh, you know, starting pieces. So coming from Rails to Backbone was a big transition for us on the front end team. Um, Backbone at its core provides components. So it gives us this model layer, uh, which gives us an ability to uh, manage data, communicate with the server. It gives us a view, which allows us to uh, you know, put HTML onto the DOM, listen to events. And it gave us a routing mechanism, which allowed us to tie into URL changes for URL-based states. We could do push state or anything like that. And we also had a very simple eventing system. So this gave us the ability to uh, do pub sub, to listen to events, to, to subscribe, and also to publish them. And so that's pretty much all it gave us. And I don't really want to talk about Backbone today. I want to talk about the pieces that we had to build to make this thick application and the patterns that we learned. So those components that Backbone gives us is really good. And Rails gave us a very strong MVC structure. When we moved into this thick client, we didn't have that. Backbone doesn't give you an opinionated way to build your applications. So, so one of the first things we had to do was figure out how we were going to get off a Rails application and onto this thick client. So the first thing we did was we decided that we would transition each page of our dashboard application over to a state of, a, of the thick client application. And it was pretty straightforward. We did it in a kind of piecemeal fashion. So we had this idea of an application we had this idea that we had different states. So those three states, the issues list, a single issue, and then looking at a single crash. And so starting out, the first thing we did was we wanted to start up a router. So we wanted to listen to the URLs, believing that all of our states of our application could be defined by URLs. So we still needed a way for us to tie together individual URLs and the actual state rendering. So Backbone gives us this router mechanism which can fire off events every time a URL changes. And we needed somehow to be able to tie that to our states. So we invented this idea of a director. And the director's responsibility was pretty straightforward. It would subscribe to the router. It would listen for any change events that came through. And then it would bring up a given state. And it was a pretty simple set of logic. And every time that we wanted to navigate to a new state using push state, 
the director would make sure that we tore down all the previous state's logic and start up again. And so we had this very simple architecture. We had piecemealed it together, and it had successfully gotten us off of Rails and onto Backbone. And all of it was working very well because everything was going through the URL. And then we added in an idea of a modal. Pretty straightforward. Most websites will have them at some point. Shouldn't have been that complicated of an idea, right? So when we look at this modal, this is a settings modal, very straightforward. And the first thing that I want to point out is that this settings modal actually has states itself. So you see at the top we have some tabs. So now we have the exact same type of functionality we were looking at in our application of being able to identify different states. But now it's in this isolated modal that's sitting actually on top of the application. So we needed a better structure. No longer was everything being defined by a specific URL. The single flow didn't work. And the model didn't fit. So we went back to the, the drawing board, and we introduced the idea of a settings modal being its own self-encapsulated piece of code that would live on the application. And this is really where we saw the birth of the idea of the module. Um, and when we talk about modules, what I'm talking about is isolated pieces of functionality divided along business lines. So our settings module had a specific uh, set of functionality it wanted to execute. It had a way to render itself. It had its whole MV star structure running within it. Um, you know, and just like we had with our applications, we wanted to use some sort of eventing system. It made sense to be able to fire an event to say start and bring up the, the individual module, and also to be able to trigger an event called stop and tear it down. And so because we had a very simple application to start, we were actually adding these events directly onto the individual modules. So you see here, uh, you know, we're listening to the trigger event on the component, the settings component, and we're tearing it down using the exact same piece of functionality. And so this was an okay start. Uh, but then we had to address the nature of asynchronous behavior. And so what I mean by that is that when we brought up a settings module, we wanted it to be able to go and communicate with the server and then also render some certain functionality. And we needed to handle the case of being able to start up and tear down that module while still executing asynchronous functionality. And we needed a way to do it cleanly. So this was a big problem for us in the, you know, starting out. And we did a lot of conditionals. We did a lot, lot of event registration to the stop event. Uh, but we figured there would be a better way. And so this is where we started using the promises pattern. So promises at their core is a task. And to that task, you can attach functionality to be executed upon completion, successful completion, upon failure, or just any time that that task moves from the state of pending to a resolved or rejected state. And so anyone uh, who isn't familiar with promises, jQuery actually provides a really nice interface for them uh, that allows you to create them. And it also uses that same interface and a lot of its asynchronous functionality. Uh, one of the prime examples is actually being able to fetch data. And so uh, here we see a very simple set of uh, functionality where we have two different data fetches going on. And we're going to store the response that we get from that function into these variables. And on completion, successful completion, we're going to console it out for that first fetch. We can also console out no matter what uh, on the second fetch. And so these line up with the very familiar idea of being able to pass in callbacks to a uh, success uh, or a complete or error uh, within the AJAX um, uh, interface. And so then we can also do one other really neat thing with promises. We can actually composite them together. And so jQuery, again, provides a really neat way to do that with its when. And you can pass in multiple promises and then attach events to be executed. So here, if any of these fetches fail, we're going to console that out. So how does this tie into using it with components? So when our settings module would start up, we made a promise that we would stop. <clears throat> and then what we were able to do is every time we wanted to perform a specific functionality that we needed to tear down on stop, we could register those callback methods with that promise. And so here we have, again, these two same fetches going on. And when they're both complete, we're going to render some logic uh, onto the DOM. We're going to do some rendering logic. And then when we stop the settings, we're going to make sure that anything listening to the stop event uh, to be resolved will be executed. And so this allows us to manage all these types of asynchronous behaviors. 
We also use this a lot with our animations and that kind of functionality as well. And so this was a really effective answer in the short run, but it left us very vulnerable uh, for what was to come. So at the time, we started out with a settings modal, and our settings modal existed one per application. And we only had one application, and it was a singleton. So it was pretty straightforward. We just fire events. Everyone knew that it existed. Anyone could fire on it. And pretty soon, we started adding other different types of components. So these are functionality pieces that were existing outside of a unique state. So we added a real-time uh, component that allowed us to wrap around socket I.O., and that would allow us to receive uh, information from a server and broadcast that out. We added an alert center, which would listen to events from our real-time component, and for specific types of events, it would render content onto the DOM, as well as allow users to get a quick overview of all their different applications. And we also created an analytics component. And our analytics component was responsible for asynchronously fetching a third-party script, loading it onto the DOM, and then tracking user behavior. So all this stuff was working through the simple events, the ability to subscribe and publish, and it was a pretty straightforward mechanism. So as with anything uh, that you build over time, our thick client application started to get a little more complicated. So we began to introduce the idea of having multiple applications running seamlessly in the browser. So far, I've been talking about our dashboard application, which had these three very distinct states. It had a you know, very distinct set of behavior. It was showing information about crashes and allowing you to manipulate that information through the browser. But part of the Crashlytics process is integrating SDKs and plugins uh, into the development process and into your application. So we needed to present through the browser a very simple walkthrough process. And we were concerned about different types of behavior, different types of functionality than our dashboard application was. And so we decided to split this out into its own application. So it had its own view, its own mechanisms. And the moment that we did that, we realized that our applications began to look a lot like our components. We needed a way to make sure that we could start each application as well as shut it down and clean up any of its dependencies that it may have, anything that it had executing any of its asynchronous functionality. And so at this point, our architecture for our overall uh, thick client application had begun to change. Now we were entering through a router. The router was triggering events. Each of our applications was listening for specific events. They were then informing the right director to start a state and then our state could communicate with our router and start the process all over again. Now you notice on that page, I didn't show our components. And the reason why is that we had to address the persistence of them. So in the original assumption that we made, a component would live on a specific application. Now our components were living between applications. And they weren't all living though, right? So we had some shared behavior. When I was on the onboarding process, I didn't care about the settings. I didn't care about the alert center. But I did want real-time notifications, and I did want to be able to track user behavior. And so we started adding in these heavy conditions as part of the stop process for each application to understand what the next state was going to be and to shut down anything that wasn't going to be used. And obviously, this wasn't the most elaborate pattern, and it wasn't the best pattern. Um, the more components that we added, the more functionality we wanted to share between applications, the harder it got to manage it, and the more difficult it became to keep our code scalable. So we started finding this pattern. All these different pieces at all these different levels had the exact same problems. <clears throat> we had components that needed to know how to start and stop themselves, how to manage their, dependence, their dependencies, and how to communicate through events. And we had the same thing running for our applications and the router, and the same thing even internally with our states listening to directors. So we had been solving these problems in slightly different ways, and we knew that there must be a unified answer to this pattern. And the first thing we decided to do was to try to start isolating our knowledge. So, so far, we had direct knowledge of all the different components, and all the applications had direct knowledge of each other as well. And so, you know, this clearly shows up in how we were managing stopping dependencies when moving between these different applications. And the first step that we did was we started eventing with arguments. So it's possible when you fire off events, if you're using jQuery or anything else, 
to pass along arguments that can be used by anyone listening, anyone who's subscribed. And so the first thing we did is when we would start a new application, we'd make sure that we triggered a stop mechanism and we passed in the dependencies that we wanted to keep around. And this allowed us in our stop mechanism for each of these applications to loop through, identify which modules were not being shared, and trigger a stop mechanism on them. It's pretty straightforward. But we were still pretty tightly coupled. We still had direct knowledge that there was such a thing as an onboarding application, that there was such a thing as a logged out application, and that we, could trigger fun that we could trigger events on them. And so we wanted to go a step further and start simplifying this functionality. So the next step that we introduced was using event. So all of these different components to date were using the same eventing mechanism of on, one, off, and trigger. But they were using them in an isolated case on that specific piece of code. So what we did was we took all that functionality and we brought it to a higher level that we could share between these different pieces as part of the instantiation. So what that allowed us to do is now, instead of having direct knowledge of the actual pieces of code, we could communicate through this event and trigger specific, uh, or publish specific events that they would be listening to. So here you see our onboarding start mechanism is now triggering an app dashboard stop event, still passing along the dependencies, and the same thing, obviously, with our logged out application. So it was a little bit better. We didn't have direct references, but we still had that tightly coupled knowledge that these other applications existed. So the next step that we took was to try and create some smarter subscriptions. So now we decided that every time an application started, what it was truly trying to say is that if anyone else starts, I need to shut down. So as part of our start process, we began triggering these higher level events. So it was a very simple change. We just decided to fire an app on before start event, and we would pass in our dependencies. And as, start, as part of the start process, we would also bind to that event so that we could stop ourselves. And what this allowed us to do is get rid of any type of knowledge of whether or not this was the first load of an application, the first load of the web page, no other application was running, that's fine. No one would have responded to the event. But if we were moving between applications, this gave us a very clean process for shutting them down. And so the last big piece that we had to try and, and tackle was about sharing information. And so one of the great things about doing events is that it can fire off specific functionality, and that happens without any shared knowledge of what it is that's going on. So we use that sub-pub pattern. It's a little bit more difficult when you want to actually be able to communicate information between these different moving parts. And so we wanted to use our same vent. We didn't want to add in an entire new mechanism. And we decided that the easiest answer would actually be able to register responses and request data. And so this gave us the ability to have synchronous data returns. And so through that event, we were able to set responses with a given key and have a function passed in that would execute and return a response. And likewise, you know, we could request that response. As we see here, the dashboard application on its start would register what a current application is. And the settings module, when it loaded up, would request that data so that it could have what it needed without having to go back to the server uh, and fetch it itself. So we could begin to share information. And so the last part is tying it all together. So these are you know, a very simple pattern that we were trying to establish. We wanted to be able to isolate our functionality into unique individual modules. We wanted to make sure that we could stop them and start them, as well as transition in to different states within them. We want to make sure we cleaned up any of our dependencies and we could share them intelligently between different individual pieces of code. We want to make sure that we did all this through an eventing mechanism so that anyone could subscribe or unsubscribe and publish events as they saw fit. And we wanted to make sure that we could handle asynchronous behavior going on. So in our application, we began to really rethink this flow. At the beginning, we always had the router as the core. And as time went on, we began to realize that there were states within the applications that existed without URLs. It wasn't a safe assumption to make sure that everything could be a tokenized state. So we put at the top level of our application this idea of event. And so we still wanted to be able to listen to URLs, though, in case anyone navigated around. And that was still an important component. So our router would subscribe to our event and be able to publish events whenever a URL was changed. So this also allowed us then for our event to tell the router to update itself and go to a new URL 
whenever a new state was requested. And so off the vent, we added these components and these different applications. And these applications and components each had their starts and their stops, and we were able to communicate through the vent for that. Now, the next level was actually compositing this pattern. And so internally in our application, when it was instantiated and started for the first time, it would create its own vent that it would use with its states. So now when a URL came through the router to the vent, the app would listen to that, and then it would echo it down to execute a specific state within it. And this pattern also allowed us to do this for our components. So our components were able to listen for their individual states and actually navigate through them and clean itself up appropriately. So we see, we see the same pattern playing out on multiple levels within the application. So how is this applicable to you? So how many people here are actually building or have ever built a large web scale or uh, single page applications? All right, so a few. How many people have built individual pieces of functionality they needed to run on a single web page at all? So you're, you, know, you load up the site, you want to have a tabbed piece of content. Right? So these types of problems happen all over on multiple levels and multiple levels of complexity. And this pattern allows us to be able to isolate down that functionality and communicate between individual parts with their own responsibilities and share any dependencies that they may have. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Uh, I will uh, put it up on slide deck uh, and do that. Yeah, it's not right now, but I'll, I'll put it up on like uh, SharePoint or something like that. I'll put it up on uh, like a SharePoint or something. Somewhere, I'll send out a link about it. I'll tweet it out for that. Yeah? Um, so it sounds like you basically have like, you created the modules that can be nested. They've been what? You kind of have these modules that can be like modules nested inside of them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, the question was about how we handle, as an example, a URL that may be representative of a specific state within an application or even a module within the state within the application. And so there are several different ways that we handle that. When we try to isolate our functionality, we try to create a single vent for the shared components between them. And so for that example, what we can do and what we normally do is that the uh, vent will receive the signal, it'll inform the application, and the application will actually echo that down. So we'll do some event propagation there to actually make sure that it can go down all the different events, and anyone who cares can actually execute their functionality accordingly. Yes? I, I do actually, I, I wrote a demo for this guy, um, but, and I can also publish that as well on, uh, on GitHub. I'll send that out, definitely. Cool. Thank you, guys. Oh, my bad. Sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we actually we did look at a couple other frameworks. Uh, in the beginning, so the question was, we decided using Backbone, and we invented uh, this way of, of structuring our application, and did we look at uh, other frameworks like Ember or anything like that. So in the beginning, we absolutely did, um, but we decided that the uh, nature of our application didn't lend itself well to those frameworks. Um, you know, I've experimented and used them in the past, and we've actually pulled inspiration from them um, about how we manage some stuff about states, but uh, it wasn't right for us. Yeah, definitely. And how do you share a, a view between your applications? 
Sure. Um, so sharing views between applications. Uh, so the question was, how do we use our venting mechanism uh, with backbone views? And how do we share views between different applications? And so uh, my number one answer to that would be, one, the two definitely do not interfere. Uh, so I talked about states at a high level. Uh, but a state would actually be you know, its own set of functionality for rendering and that kind of stuff. And we do use a composite architecture called Marionette to handle complex view rendering. Um, but that actually can communicate with our vents as well. And so uh, the same pattern kind of can repeat itself down. And there's nothing to say that, uh, you know, and, and Marionette is an example, uh, a parent view actually can have a venting on itself and the child view can listen to those and execute in a similar manner. When it comes to sharing our uh, views between different applications. At that point, we would identify that as an isolated piece of functionality that no longer is part of an application, but rather it's something that lives between applications. And so we would pull that out actually as its own module that would be executed, that would be triggered off when the application needed it. And so that's how we would basically, we'd identify it as a dependency between the states or between the applications. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, guys.